forensic accountant, uh, whose interests include taxation, government, and nonprofit accounting, um, as well as state and government performance and financing. He is uh, the chair of the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors Collective Bargaining Congress, which oversees the 80 collective bargaining units within the AAUP. Including the CFA. Including the CFA. I know you guys aren't exactly AAUP, but you kind of are. No, that has, I know. <laughs> he has done financial audits of 39 universities, including eight CSUs. So uh, we are very happy to have him here today, but also his presentation today is in the context of our collective bargaining and our, uh, we're building our fall campaign leading up to our strike vote uh, that will be happening, our authorization to strike vote that will be happening beginning on Monday. Uh, our bargaining is now in the statutory process of fact-finding. Um, the CSU will say um, we may have the money, but we would like to spend it on other things. Howard's report will be showing us um, indeed they have the money and where uh, that money is being spent. More specifically, he will show that Sonoma State has the money. Um, our administration has just chosen to spend that money on different things. Uh, rather than faculty salaries and faculty hiring and uh, our academic, our core academic mission. So in the next hour, we'll see the details, and uh, then we'll have a chance for questions. Um, this proceeding is being recorded and will be available in its entirety, probably on the CFA uh, Facebook page, or I'm not sure more generally. I'm looking at Sue. I don't know where. <laughs> on YouTube. Thank you. And, uh, and we will also um, provide the slides uh, from Howard's presentation today also uh, to broadly to whoever would like to see those. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Howard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Great to be here. Uh, one correction, I did sneak a PhD in there uh, in accounting from the University of Chicago. I snuck that in there somewhere along the way. Uh, I think I'm up to 50 now of these, 52 actually, presentations around the country, if you can believe it. Uh, and I've done about half the CFA, it seems, uh, at forums uh, like this. But every place is different within the CFA, within the CSU. Uh, every CSU institution is very different, as we'll see. And one thing, if I seem a little on edge, uh, my beloved and everything means everything to me, the New York Mets play game five tonight. Uh, <laughs> and I'm a little nervous. And any Met fans here? Not a single one. <laughs> Anyone from New York here? Not one of you. Okay. Well, I lived in Chicago for a lot of years and hate them. So, uh, yeah. But rooting for the Mets, I was telling you, rooting for the Mets is why I'm a union activist. We're always up against it. Everyone's crapping on us. Everything goes against us. The world is against us, but we, the only way we could do anything is by standing together. So that's what being a Met fan is about. And, uh, so being a union activist is about. And uh, certainly been proud to work with CFA. We, you guys have a new leader in Jen Egan who I've gotten to uh, speak with and work with. And I've, uh, whether you guys know it or not, during your last, one of your prior negotiations, I got to testify at one of the arbitration hearings and uh, got cross-examined by the uh, chancellor's attorneys. And that was a wonderful experience. Uh, so, uh, we'll go from there. And these, you know, this is yours. Uh, all this is yours. You guys, do, once we're done here, I send it all out to you guys. Anyway, this is general. Uh, CSU and the state are doing very well. The future looks good. Uh, this university itself is doing well. Solid reserves and cash flows. Uh, administration here is growing faster than faculty and enrollment, and there's a big decline in tenure track hiring, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, and I certainly know what happened this fall. We're going to talk about that in context as well. So, uh, by the way, ask questions whenever you feel like. I know there's 90 slides here, but we're going to get through them like that. If I skip over a slide real fast, remember you can have access to them. And we're going to hopefully focus on the big stuff. So, this is the basic setup of CSU, 23 campuses, 92 u university related organizations. These are the ones that the Chancellor's Office says are completely separate. We have nothing to do with them, they, they don't matter at all. Uh, we all know how untrue that is. Uh, these are the ones with SSU. Most of the data I'm going to show you ignores those, but you do know when it came time to pay the president's extra money where they found the money, they found the money in these related organizations. So the money's there. Uh, 
Anyway, this is, this is see, the first, well, the, so the first, other than 90, but the first 20 or so slides are CSU, are CSU only. And I think that's important. First of all, you're in bargaining. Um, Jen Egan had asked me to do that. And I know you guys are very interested in what's happening here. I get that. And we're going to get to that real fast. Just, so just bear with me as we just get the system as a whole. And then we're going to focus, mo the majority of the presentation will focus on what's happening right here at your university. So uh, these are, this is the university itself. They have assets of over $16 billion. It's just a lot of money. Uh, it's in billions to speak. Uh, and live. So we, how, how much of these net assets? So it's these two together equal the blue. Red and green equal blue. And the issue is how much of the green are what we would call reserves that they could spend as freely or unfreely as they like. This is the growth over time. And that's wonderful. These are the auxiliaries growing over time. Even better. This is the state itself. There's something called the legislative, and I get all my stuff from here from something called the LAO, the Legislative Analyst Office. They're the ones that do the, they forecast where the tax revenue is going. They're, they're basically the researchers for the state legislature. That's who they are. And they allegedly don't have a policy angle. They're supposed to be just economists and accountants and finance people who don't have a policy viewpoint. So they just, like me, they just kind of report what is and what they think is going to happen. And you can just see in California, some of this personal income, this big increase in personal income tax, there was a, there was a the voters, you guys in the state voted for an increase in the top uh, income tax rate, as you remember. Uh, here's a recession here. That greenish coming down is the recession. You can see things are, these are projections, obviously, 16 to 18 are all projections from, by these people here. But certainly things are looking pretty good going forward. Unemployment, uh, California obviously, much higher, you know, back in these days, none of you guys were even around then in the 90s. You guys were all too young to have been here in the 90s. Uh, I don't know who was president then, but his wife sure looked good the other night, didn't she? Uh, if I could just put that, if I could just say that, throw that one in there. I thought she looked great. Uh, you can see it coming down. But even having said that, I think there's a lot of discomfort uh, because even though the unemployment rate's now coming down, uh, in the 5 to 6 percent range, which historically, as you see, is low, uh, there's still a lot of people who seem to have given, they're out of the workforce, so not counted as unemployed, or they're working part-time and they want to work full-time, they're also not counted. So I think alternative measures of unemployment tell somewhat a, a somewhat worse story, even though this looks, looks very beneficial. This is the money coming from the state legislature to all of CSU. You can see big drop here, big drop here, and then solid increase. So just keep this in mind. Here's the graph. Same graph, different scale. Look at the scale here. See, I started two billion. Here, I started zero. This is what the administration liked to tell you that oh my god, it went to like zero. Uh, well, it didn't quite go to zero, but <laughs> I'm not saying one graph is more relevant than the other. I'm not saying anyone is cheating or putting one. I think they're both relevant. But remember, you could play with it. We all know how to use Excel pretty well, don't we? Uh, a lot of us do. And, uh, or, or keynote or numbers, uh, we use all that stuff, right? Uh, us academics, or us, us numbery, geeky academics do. And you can play with this real easily. It's not that hard to get the same. Anyway, so this is the annual percentage change in CSU appropriation. A couple minutes, we're going to compare it to see how this looks compared to SSU's appropriation. And you can see the big declines here, and we have modest increases here. You know, 17, we kind of know, we think it's going to go up another couple of percent, four, five, six percent, but that's not done yet. So. Why was there that big drop in 2011? Well, the legislature thought the world was coming to an end, and uh, we see, you know, this is very common. I think they decided the world was coming to an end and decided to give you guys a lot less money, and Jerry Brown came in uh, on top of that. Though I'm, I'm not saying he's a hero at all. Don't. I mean, you guys, you guys are too young to remember the old Jerry Brown. Uh, I was at SMU in Dallas in 1992 when he was running for president. You guys don't remember he ran for president like five times, but he ran. He was actually running in 92. He's not the same guy now that he was then. Uh, back then, he sounded like Bernie Sanders does now. That, if I could, if I, you guys know who Bernie Sanders is? Yeah. <laughs> Some of us even remember Jerry back then. <laughs> He does not sound like he did then. No. He is not the same guy. 
not the same guy. So. Okay, so this compares, what I did here is compare the appropriation per full-time equivalent student. And we use FTE students because it's a way to, because a lot of, even though here at Sonoma, the vast majority of the students are full-time. You don't have, you have some part-time students here, but it's not a large part-time contingent here. Uh, so the full-time equivalent student is almost the same as headcount Rome. It's like 88%. Uh, but still, when you start comparing states and other universities, FTE is a better way to compare uh, in general. And you can see California pretty much in the middle uh, in terms of appropriation for FTE student. Alaska and Wyoming, I think there's four people that live here and three people that live here. <laughs> so I'm not so sure how relevant those states are. Nothing against Alaska and Wyoming. I put New York in there just because I'm from there. Uh, I put Michigan there because I live there now. Uh, other than that, I put states that border this one, uh, though I know Washington doesn't, but they're close enough, aren't they? Uh, even though I, I, I get the geography, I've certainly been there a lot. Uh, but this is pretty sad down here. We, we have a lot of stuff going on in Oregon, and that's, that's pretty sad there. Uh, you know, Oregon's got a weird tax structure, as you know. They have a very high income tax, but no sales tax, and Washington's got the flip, you know, got the reverse of that. It's got no income tax and a high sales tax. And New Hampshire, live free or die, and you just die if you're poor uh, in New Hampshire. And uh, so this is per capita. This was per FTE student. This is per person. And you get slightly, six people live in North Dakota. Uh, and California, a little higher when you get there. Uh, but still, so. Then you look at the change from 10 to 15. So this, this, this is one more year forward as 14. And so California has increased. And, but you know, the, the gentleman asked the question here. I think it came down so much that, you know, at least it's positive. At least the, and what, what, what I mean by that is if I look here versus here, you see how it's up? Here's 15, here's 10. So at least it's higher. But a lot of the administrators in the CSU system point to, and rightfully so, the appropriation here is still not what it was back here. It's still not as high, in, and enrollment has grown in that time. So it's still, just at gross level, no inflation adjusted, no anything, it still is not high as it was here. It's higher than it was here after a big decline. And I, I did not, Grapevine does, you know, they're the ones that do the five year stuff, and, uh, but still, Louisiana's last, that's Bobby Jindal, he's running for president. You wouldn't know that from the poll numbers, but uh, I was just in Louisiana not that long ago. And they, the legislature was debating either a 78% cut or a 40% cut to higher education. So when they gave them a 40% cut, they had a parade throughout the state uh, as if that was somehow okay. Uh, that's the way they frame things in Louisiana. So as bad as you think it is, you could be in Louisiana. <laughs> I mean that with all due respect for anyone. Anyone from Louisiana? You guys all from here? <laughs> Everyone's from California, huh? All right, it's great. So these are the reserves of the system. The system has now reached $2 billion in reserves, and most of which is unrestricted. Restri what is, what's restricted reserves? Those are reserves that are specifically set aside for future scholarships, for debt reservice, uh, for paying off future debt. Because uh, generally the way the, the way the debt works, the system borrows the money. And then they allocate resources to the campuses. But the system is the borrower. Yes? So why were they so much higher, the restricted ones, earlier? Yeah. Well, what ha as these restricted ones are, as you borrow for buildings and stuff and then you spend, they just, they just go away. Okay. And the rules, and it's a good question, because the rules on restricted are you can't touch them. But the reason the bond rating agencies count them, and they don't matter that much here, but they matter in some other systems. They certainly mattered here. But the reason the bond agency ratings count them, it's, let's say you have a mortgage on your house, right? And you're lucky enough to have a fund where in this fund is all your future principal and interest payments. But the rules are you can't touch the fund even if your ch kids get sick, or your kids need to go to college, you, you, your, car gets, your car gets totaled, you can't touch it. Are you better off having that fund? Well, of course you're better off having it, even though you can't touch it. 
And, but these are, and, well, are, and I'll, I'll give you the administration's arguments as to what they say about these unrestricted funds. I'll just briefly tell you, they don't believe they're unrestricted. The administration argues they're really not unrestricted. Despite, and the best argument against them is we have external auditors, and guess what? They put them in the unrestricted category. Mm -hmm. So, well, if the, if the external auditors put it there, that's good enough for me. The other thing is, this only goes through 14. Fiscal year 15 ended. Uh, the CFO statements, and we've talked to the, you know, we, we've tried to get, uh, about a month ago, we, we myself, I work with the, with, a, with the CFA people, we worked to craft a data request to get the financial statement so that we could tell what this looked like to 15. They wouldn't give it to us. They said it's too preliminary. Well, we're sitting here in October. They know the numbers. They're done. Those financial statements are going to be released anywhere in the next two to five weeks. They're going to be publicly released. I will bet anyone in this room that the, this green bar is higher. I guarantee it. Another great year for the CSU system. Congratulations. They're building up reserves. And as I'll talk about, to what end? To what end do you have such? Why are you building up these reserves? Uh, so we'll talk about that. Here's the annual cash flows. Let me talk about the difference between these two. This is not necessarily money that, that just sitting in the chancellor's office, but it's the, the accumulation of things of basically year after year, they're spending less than they're taking in every year. And so that's what this is. These line green bars are the excess cash flows. It's all the operating revenues coming in from tuition, the state, grants, contracts, versus paying for everything. Keeping the lights on, paying you guys, cutting the grass, everything. And here, furloughs and unnecessary cuts. Yes, that's an editorial comment, but uh, Elaine, and I, Elaine agrees with me, I think, and I hope many. These were not necessary. They did not need to do this to you guys. And look what happened. They furloughed you, and oh my god, they generated a whole bunch of cash flows. That's over a half a billion dollars in excess cash flows for the system in 2014. Uh, and that's why, so I won't bore you, Rudy and I, uh, Rudy Fifth and Bound, yes, go ahead. And then the last graph, is this per year or is this these like are accumulation? All, these, these are all, that's a good question. That's a very good question. These are accumulations. I, I'm not going to, for the, any county majors in the room? Well, you're, you're on your way because, <laughs> because <laughs> you are because you, because the, these are the accumulations. Okay, and that's what would be on a balance sheet. It keeps these are what happens every year. So you're on your, your one more class and you're <laughs> and, and and you're done. But that's the good question. That's really that. Well, at least someone's paying attention. I got one in the audience paying attention. At least I got somebody. Uh, I teach at night a lot. And, you know, we have night class where I am, and it's a challenge to keep them uh, interested in accounting. Uh, uh, we, we go until 9.15 and 9.20. It's kind of a challenge to keep them awake at that hour because most of them work during the day, so it's a long day for them. Anyway, Rudy and I, Rudy Fickman, I'm president of AUP, and you know, we've been doing this for a while together. We came up with a ratio system very similar to what Moody's did for se several states. We came up with a score. Basically, you have four ratios that tell you we're trying to get a score. How is the place doing? Do they have a lot of reserves? Do they have too much debt? How are revenues doing versus expenses? And are they generating cash? And depending on the score, depending on where the university is at, you get a score from zero to five. And so, without, so these are the numbers for C the CSU system, and these are the final scores. And they're all pretty solid. They're all pretty solid. And we'll go over, we'll go over this in more detail with SSU as well, but they're all pretty solid. And what it leads to is this, an AA2 bond rating, and this bond rating is pretty recent. I mean, that's uh, how long ago was July 6, 2015, not that long ago at all. So this all comes from Moody's. No, I didn't say it. I didn't write any of this. Nation's single largest four-year higher education system, very strong student demand, ample unrestricted liquidity, and favorable operating cash flow. In other words, they like this and that. That's what they're saying. They, they, they not add also. Uh, I don't have the, I don't have the, I've not cornered the market on adding. Uh, Improve state funding and funding strengthening of California's economy. Challenges, continued material reliance and appropriation of the state, moderately high balance sheet leverage. We'll see a lot of debt relative to comparing rated large state systems and universities. Who owns the debt? System. It's the all system, system here. So we borrow it from ourselves. Yeah, no, no. The system borrows it from the outside world. From the outside. The system borrows it from the outside world. You're, 
you, the system CFO, the chancellor, they love going to New York. They meet with Moody's, they meet with Standard & Poor's. They wear fancy clothes, they go to fancy restaurants, they tell them how great they're doing. And they, they say, look at our reserves, they tell them how great they are. They get complimented for keeping costs low, which means not paying you guys. Uh, and this is, what, this is what they get. They get high bond ratings. So the Moody's ratings AE2, the S&P ratings AE minus. The state is doing almost as well. Why are they doing well? High reserves, solid cash flows. So uh, the bottom line of this is, the system also will say this money spoken for cannot be touched. The reality is that these reserves can be touched. Uh, but they don't even need them. They have all the cash flows now to pay you guys. The bond ratings are high for a reason. High reserves, high cash flows. Not my opinion, an outside independent agency. They have the ability to enroll more students, hire more faculty, and pay you guys appropriately. They just choose not to. So what's now? That didn't take long, did it? Now we're here. So here's this place. And I've lived with this place for the last several weeks, virtually, not here. I got here last night, but now I see it. Uh, there's been a building boom on this campus. You guys notice that? There's been... <laughs> yeah. There was a big issue of debt in 13. I guess that was probably related to the student center that just recently opened. Uh, a lot of new dorms, from what I've read. A lot of new dorms. Uh, that's great. I think new dorms are great. New buildings are great. Everything's wonderful. Everyone's happy. Uh, so that's, that's wonderful. This is where the money is. This is, so breaking down, there's about $450 million of assets for Sonoma State. Uh, I, SSU, I, I don't live here. Is it, you guys go by that? Is that seem like, that seems the way the press and you guys report stuff. So I took that shorthand. Uh, it's a lot easier to write. So I just went with that. So growth and build. So the, the line green, it went down a lot here because this, this is a paper loss uh, in investment. And this is not outside of the endowment. We're talking, this, has, this is completely independent of the endowment. And you can see over time, the line green, cash and investments, why are they getting bigger and bigger? Because every year at Sonoma State, revenues exceed expenses. They're generating excess cash flows every year. That's why the, the this one, is big because they just keep building stuff. They just keep building stuff. And so they also, by the way, say, I've heard it, I've heard it from all your systems people, we have the strictest walls between the universities and these related organizations. They cannot talk to each other ever. Right. Uh, this comes from the audit statements. These are transactions, these are all the trends. If I got to, if as an accountant, if the CFO here let me look, I would see thousands of transfers back and forth between the main university and these related organizations. And this is, they put this in their financial This is just a couple of examples. Payments from discreetly presented component units, that's these organizations that are allegedly on the other side of the walls for salaries of personnel working on contracts, grants, and other programs, etc. You can see the numbers. This is just information, this is just right in the financial statement for SSU. So Cash investments of the auxiliaries not included in prior grants. So this is the endowment. So this is the endowment, what's called the endowment, which is people giving money to specifically the endowment, which declined here due to mostly a paper loss and then has been growing slightly. It grows for two reasons. You raise more money and those, those investments earn a return. Uh, my view here is you don't raise all that much money here, no offense. Uh, whoever the People who raise funds here, they don't raise all that much. Uh, but I'll leave that for another day. And the other investments, this is just outside of the endowments. You can see they got almost $60 million. Now, I'm not saying this money can be touched or used for faculty salaries on a regular basis. They can't. The rules prevent it. But it's nice to have, isn't it? And they could be using some of this money, I think, even more so than they do to support student scholarships and the like. Though they do have rules, the endowment has rules on how, uh, what percent of that could be spent, and typically it's anywhere from three to five percent. Gets three to five percent of this, and this is a, an accumulation, so three to five percent of the dark green gets spent for mostly uh, student scholarships and help for needy students, which is good. Uh, we talked about reserves. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my cold will go away at the Mets win tonight. I'm convinced of that. If they lose, I'm in misery for the next 20 years. Anyway. 
the net assets, 198 million. Let me show you what we're talking about here. We're talking about this guy right here. You see that right at 200 million? So we're trying to figure out, for Sonoma State, the difference between assets and liabilities is $200 million. So we're trying to figure out, of that $200 million, how much represents true reserves. Well, a lot of it, so there's four categories of reserves. One is zero. Invested in capital, what is that? That's the buildings. That's the buildings that are here, free of debt, and those don't represent any financial flexibility or freedom for the university. The university is not going to sell these buildings. As nice as they are, they're actually using them, I hope. Uh, they don't just sit there. They actually get used by faculty, students, community, etc. So the value, these reserve, you know, the net assets that are attached to the buildings don't tell us anything and we can't touch them and they're not part. So I'm, there's no way Sonoma State has close to $200 million. What the true reserves are is down here. Here's the unrestricted, which have gone down a little, and here's the restricted. So it's about $54 million. That's about what they've got. Now, should they go ahead and spend that $54 million? Is $54 million high, low? That's what I'm about to show you. So this is graphically, this is what's going on graphically. Big things went down here, and other things have been getting better. I don't know about 15. I'll predict it's up here. Because they keep paying you guys what they're paying you. Uh, I, and they're not hiring. They didn't hire then. So, and enrollment was good. So I think 15 is going to be up here. People here, people in this room, I think, know the answer. They're just not going to say. But uh, I'll predict that's where it is. Anyway, this is the primary reserve ratio. So let me spend a couple minutes here. This tells me how much of the, how big is 54 million dollars? Okay, is, is it small? I mean, it sounds like a lot of money, right? But you need context. So the context is the size of the university. So what's the size of the university? The expenses, total expenses. So the numerator is reserves. $172 million in expenses, so the reserve ratio is 31%. So the blue is SSU, 50% is the gold standard, so to speak. And so you can see where SSU is, certainly pretty solid in the good to very good range, nowhere near trouble. You don't want to go much before this line. I think what this tells you is that they're about $10, 20000000 million, depending on how you count, more than they would need comfortably. Should they just spend 10 to 20 million dollars? Well, that depends on the annual cash flows, as we're going to look at in a second. So here's the annual cash flows. These are the operating cash flows. And so what do we do with these? The denominator here is total revenues, which is very similar to total expenses. So in 2014, this university generated 17 million dollars in operating cash flow. Now what are those? That's all the cash, is pure cash. All the cash that came in from tuition, from the state, Grants, contracts, etc. That less all the cash paid out for scholarships, salaries, vendors, everything. And I even put in Rudy and I put interest in there. We even put interest in there. Interest costs. The bond rating agencies have a higher ratio for Sonoma State and for the CSU system. They don't put in. We put interest in there. So this includes this expense. You know these expenses include in, this. This number here is reduced by the couple million dollars that Sonoma State spent is charged, you don't actually spend it, it's charged, it's kind of internal. The system charges Sonoma State for interest. You can see their annual cash flows, last three years, 13.7, 16.9, 17 and a half million dollars. That's what they're generating every year. And to be safe, they, oh, less than half of that would be necessary. So my, my guess, my view is that there's about anywhere from five to 10 million extra cash flows they're generating that they don't need to be generating every year that could be used for better purposes than just building up reserves. That's my view. And that would solve most every problem you guys are talking about with them in negotiations. These are the, this is the composite ratio score for SSU and CSU. That's at three points. You can see Sonoma State is almost tied. They were below the system as a whole, then above, and now right about the same. This is trouble. This is like, oh my God, and this is Perfect. There are eight public universities that have uh, a <coughs> perfect score. University of Washington, Seattle is one of them. Uh, Texas A&M is another. University of Michigan. Uh, so there are some that do have that perfect triple, that perfect five score and perfect triple A rating. So, anyway, what the CSU and the SSU administration would say to outsiders in the budget and our responses? They would say the key is the budget. 
I say actual financial statements. So you hear the word the budget, the budget, the budget. What is a budget? A budget is a plan. That's all it is. It's a plan on what you're going to spend next year. Budgets always balance. Revenues always equal expenditures. Actual statements tell us what happened. I'm not saying that budgets shouldn't be done. But what matters is what really happened. Now, the problem we have is the timing. The budget right now, as we speak here in October, what's being debated is the budget for 16-17. That's what's being developed now, campus-wide and system-wide. The 15-16 budget's already done. It's in the books because we're in that year we're spending it now. We don't even have the results of 14-15 yet in terms of the actions. So we're, now, we don't have them in a month. <laughs> We'll be on the same footing as the administration. They have them. They know it because the year ended June 30th. They know the results. They just not. We asked. They said, no, we're not sharing. Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's all you can do is ask. You can't, you can't, hit, can't hit them over the head. Uh, we asked nicely, too. <laughs> there were no bad words in the. I, I wrote the thing out. There were no bad words in there. We asked very, please, please. We would really appreciate that kind of stuff. Good night. All right. They'd also say, we're limited to what we could charge for tuition. We would love to spend more on faculty salaries and students, but there are significant political hurdles, and those reserves are spoken for restricted. The truth, administrations at SCU, they have much more flexibility than they claim. Unrestricted is unrestricted, and there are solid reserves and large excess annual cash flows. So this is what they would say, this is what we would say. So let's where, let's where the money's coming from. This is, again, everything here is, from here to the end, is just your campus here. 31% of the money comes from tuition. What are auxiliaries? Housing, dining, student union, bookstore, parking. If you had a golf course, I don't think you have one here. Uh, if you had people paying for athletics, I don't think people paid us for sports here. You don't have a Division I sports team here, I don't believe. Uh, up in San Jose, we went there. That's a big sinkhole there at San Jose State. By the way, San Jose State President Susan Martin used to be at president of Eastern Michigan. Uh, God bless them, that's all I can say. Uh, she was not all that faculty friendly to us. I don't think she's going to change uh, going, in, which is, well, the rest speaks for itself. 29% of your money comes from the state appropriation. And we'll look at this over time. Uh, grants and contracts, financial, uh, financial aid grants, mostly Pell grants, though there is some, some state support, mostly Pell. And Pell grants do come in and go out. What I mean by that, they come into the university and then go out to the students. Uh, gifts, and then the dreaded other. There's a lot of other here, but that's what they put it in. So this is just just giving you the numbers. You can see the tuition revenue from 30. This is in thousands. I should have said that 33 million to 55 million. State appropriation. You can see it's not. Look at it. The number is just a lot lower than it, here than here. There was some capital money. Seems to have dried up. Seems to have dried up. Remember the federal stimulus. Uh, that's obviously gone. Not obviously, but it is gone. Uh, maybe if Hillary gets elected, still no chance, I don't think. I don't, I don't, they, they said the Republicans are not giving up the U.S. Congress demographically until at least 2022. So good luck with that for us. I mean, I'm sorry for somebody. Uh, you can see 30, we're 31. See how tuition beats the state? Look what it was here. Yeah. So we're not high. We, we firmly agree that the state has not done its part. And the state has hurt this place and the CSU system. They have not supported higher education to the degree they should or could. No doubt about that. But so. the administration doesn't spend the money they should. That's well, that's, that, and that's, that's where we're going. So this, this is the graphic. People like pictures, I think, better than numbers. So here's the state appropriation, and here's to it. See where it crossed? In many states, it crossed earlier than this. In most states, it crossed earlier than this. A couple of states still hasn't crossed, uh, but for the most part, that day's passed. Grants and contracts, this was the stimulus drying up. Stimulus, stimulus drying up. Auxiliaries keep doing well. So having said all that, the total revenues for this place only, just what is it taking in? Finally, in 14, bigger than they were here. So even with the decline in the state appropriation, even with the state hammering this place, and they've gotten this on the backs of students and their families here in California. And this is, and looking at the demographics of the students here, uh, the vast majority are from the state and from this region, from what the numbers tell me. You guys may think differently, but that's what the numbers tell me. 
Discounting, administrators always say the reason we're in trouble is we have to discount the, the price to get the students here. Well, so the way this, this is a sticker price. This is, the, this is not scholarships. This is just off the sticker price. Uh, scholarships have a separate expense. And so the discount rate, my numerator is here, 5 million. My denominator is the gross tuition. So this is what they take in. They take in 33. They charge 38 and change. Give kids a break and their families a break for five and change. You can see the discount rate has gone up consistently. Uh, I didn't compare it to all the other CSUs in, around the country. For a public university, it's still on the low side. It's still fairly low. That 23% is still fairly low. Can you explain a little bit more what that is, what that allowance is? That it's, some kids just do not pay the full price for a lot of different reasons. Some kids, have, a lot of it is merit, I'll be honest with you. A lot of it is, we're trying to, what they do, what most universities like this one, like mine do, is we are going to allow kids who have a very high ACT score, an SAT score, or a special talent, we're going to allow them either to not pay tuition or pay tuition at a much reduced rate. So it's not need-based financial aid. It's a lot of it is just pure merit. Uh, athletes get in sometimes at reduced rates. Uh, though you guys don't play Division I sports, you still find a way to get athletes in here who don't always pay the full sticker price. So that's what goes in. That's what's in here. And, but a lot of it, you have to, you have to increase in order to keep the client, in order to keep enrollment where it is. This is what the enrollment management people get paid to decide. They get paid to decide how much can we give away. They work with the CFO in the CFO's office, I imagine, to figure out, okay, this is, we care about this. This is the net we're going to bring in. We have, to, we have to know the numbers and how many students. We have to figure out how much of this can we give away in order to generate the revenue we need to pay everybody and do what we need to do. So I still think this is low, even though it's increasing. So this is state appropriation for SSU only. Those are those two, the, the dark, there's no darks here because the capitals have all died up. And these last couple of years are all estimates. I'm assuming for these last three years, we don't have the 15 statements yet for Sonoma, I'm assuming that all of this went up at the same rate for the system as a whole, and this is from the Legislative Analyst Office uh, estimate of where things are going. Though this is, this is pretty much done, this is an estimate. 16 is pretty much done unless there's a mid-year correction. So things are looking good, but look at the level. You can see still not quite there, but better than here, right? So if 10 is the, if 2010 is the comparable year, better. If 2008, not better. So this is, so at some places I've been, all the places are always very interested in this. Did we get the short end of the stick, right? Did we, did we get treated differently than the others? So what I did was I take out, here's the CSU system as a whole, and I take out SSU. You know what I'm saying? There's 23, so I look at the other 22. It's not that hard to subtract one number. Uh, so it's not, it's not that complicated. And so you can see, it's pretty, you guys did about what they did. I don't see any, I mean, it's never going to be perfect. I don't see any, uh, I don't see any significant change here at all, which is fine. So this is enrollment, full-time equivalent enrollment. I, you know, there's a lot of different enrollment reports out there and coming from a lot of different places. Uh, FTE, I think here on this campus, I know you guys talk about headcount more than you talk about FTE. I know that. Uh, but I think system-wide, for me being able to compare and all that, I think FTE works better. But this, when I did it, for, for, these are, there's a, a, a virtually no, sh you know, a little bit of a shift towards more full-time. I do, there has been a subtle shift in more students being more full-timey, if you know what I'm saying, over the last five years. I think there, I think the numbers told me that there's a little more residential, there's more students living on this campus than there were six, seven years ago, does that seem, that seem right? Yeah, that's, that's what the numbers kind of suggest. So, but still FTE is pretty good. There was a big drop here and we'll go into that in a second. But overall enrollment is pretty solid for a place that's this size. It's a pretty solid enrollment. This is the same graph if it's scale. You say I start here at zero. This scale looks like enrollment's pretty flat. This one looks like it's all over the place. Both are fine. Uh, so here, in order to compare it to CSU, I, you, have to use, you have to use FTE. It's really, because uh, some, some of the CSUs really have a big difference between full-time enrollment and headcount. 
and I think you'd be biasing, a, you know, you'd be biasing towards them by counting by using head count. That's my view, at least. So you can see the rest somewhat. This is the, so I have, these are the annual percentage changes in enrollment. And here's when, and this is not because student demand drop, they close the doors. They being as chancellor, they close the doors. It's not like students didn't want to come here. Uh, and then over time, it's pretty close. It's really not that far away. Uh, this is headcount on this campus. I don't have fall 15. I couldn't find any announcement or press release for fall 15. I know people here know. Uh, there was no, from what I did not see a press release this year about the enrollment or any 15th day count or 30th day count or anything like that. But you can see the decline was grad enrollment over the last couple of years. Undergrad enrollment, which is, so the green is the total. This is, so the gray plus the blue equals the green. So overall enrollment pretty solid, but there has been a decline in grad enrollment for the last, over the last five years. This is just breaking it down by college. I don't usually spend that much time because I, I don't think faculty should be fighting faculty and wear the cash cow, you're not. Uh, everyone, everyone discipline is the greatest. No matter what you teach, that's the one, that, that's, the one that's the best. Uh, isn't that the truth? We're better than everybody else. Uh, I think, the, you know, what I, I take care of from my perspective, it's a pretty even distribution across, across, the, across majors here, across camp, across colleges. Uh, Really a, a pretty good. I like this one. I love the undeclared group. That's a large undeclared group. Uh, I, I, there's reasons for that, but that's, that's a pretty, you know, I don't know how you guys feel about that. Uh, tuition and fees. You know, it's a really, it's a, the tuition and fees in this system and at this university are always kind of weird. The word tuition and the word fees mean different things here than they do to the outside world. Uh, you sometimes use the word fees to substitute for tuition and vice versa. This is my best attempt to get to it. The governor has sworn that tuition will never go up until the year 2096 uh, or something like that. He keeps swearing that tuition is never, doesn't he keep saying that? He keeps saying tuition's not going up. But somehow the tuition creeps up a little. Uh, I don't know. The fees kind of change. This is my, so there has been a huge, for the students and their families from here to here. Now, I hope there's not students who are here now that were here then. I kind of doubt that. Uh, I don't think so. But there's certainly been a movement to level off that big increase in tuition uh, back then. So what you're left with is a big, the dark green is the tuition revenue, bottom line. The lime green is the price. These days are over here and everywhere across the country. These days, you know, these huge increases in tuition, you're not going to see even 5% increase in tuition in any public system in this country. Except for my lame university, and I use the word lame in the nicest way possible, that increased tuition last year 7.8%. We're the only yeah, geniuses. Uh, and enrollment, we don't know enrollment here. And we don't know the tuition revenue here. So, All right, now let's get the priority question. A lot of different places the university spends their money. A lot of different, there's a lot of slices to this pie, aren't there? There's us. The greenish stuff is all them. Despite the words like academic support and student services, the majority of those costs are for, people, are for administrators. Institutional support is pure upper level admin. That's your president, your provost, your vice presidents. There's no, there's no anything else in there but them. And when I say them, I mean them and us. You guys do know the difference, I hope. Uh, student services, yes, there's a lot of student workers, but there's still a lot of admin costs. Academic support, the deans are in there. So the deans and the associate deans go in there. And library is also in there. I was in your, you know, in your beautiful libraries. I walked around and through. It was very nice. Uh, everything's nice here. It's great. Uh, public service is media and the PR people and all that kind of stuff. So these aren't all pure 100% administration, but everything that's shaded in green is admin kind of stuff. So a lot of stuff goes on in the university. This is kind of a description of what's, what I just said. <clears throat> this is the dollars over time. So all the green, and the dollars don't mean anything, but 
you can see instruction hasn't really moved that much, and we're going to see this is what we get to. The percent going to instruction. The level going to instruction seems low, which we'll prove in a second, and that percentage is declining. And here's what I'll say about this. No matter what is going on here and in the state, the state is not doing its job. There is no equivocation about it. The state is not supporting Snow State or the CSU system to the way it should. Given that, shouldn't the administration here and throughout the CSU system at least try to keep the percentage of the dollars going into the classroom the same, even in the face of that? Yes. But that's not what's happened here. And that, to me, is a problem. So institutional support has come down, but I think they kind of put it in these other categories. I, just as an aside, auxiliaries, I just looked at this, that, that sounds, it's mostly housing and dining here. That's what it mostly is. They generally get a nice profit from auxiliaries up here. It's beautiful. So. Anyway, uh, so what I have here, instruction is a lot more than, this is just, this comes from IPEDS, this is the Institutional Post-Secondary Education Data System, U.S. Department of Education. Uh, Elaine was kind enough to work with some of the people here in institutional research and get me this data, uh, for the most recent data, which is great. And it just shows instructions a lot of different things. But here is the comparison. Total expenses spent on instruction, SSU versus other CSU institutions. I'll just show you the graph. I mean, this is the numbers. Somebody, you know, I said to Elaine earlier, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a when you have 23 numbers that are different, one of them has to be less. Uh, is that the case? It just so happens I am at the place that is last. I've been to a bunch of other CSUs who have not been last, but I just happen to be at the one that's last. I did not notice until two weeks ago that this was the case, but uh, here you go. Uh, I, I, the, you know, and the reason this is a relevant comparison, they're facing the same environment as you are, and you're still last. And that's not good. And I think it needs to be addressed. Now, to further dig in. So here what I said is, okay, and there's a lot of numbers here, but I, a couple of things. I, I know you guys don't like looking at No one likes looking at numbers. I don't either sometimes. <laughs> salaries and benefits. So this is instruction salaries, instruction benefits, and then I add them together. So here, 31.5 and 12.8 is 44.3. You guys with me? I'll do that again. 31.5, 12. So that's everything spent, instruction, staff, everyone who teaches, their salaries and their benefits. This is all the expenses of the university. So you can see where we are. We're barely a quarter of the whole thing. So that's 44 million on instruction? Yeah, 44 million on instruction, salaries, and benefits. They, they dump, you know, I'm glad you asked that. I was trying, they dump. A lot of other stuff, they, they have three million of other costs in instruction. I don't know what they are. I don't know what other means. I know what the word means. I don't know what it is here. I would want to know, by the way, since you brought that, you know, every year there's about two, three million dollars in other in instruction. Is that consultants? Probably. Uh, but I'd like to know. So this is depressing. So I did this for the CSUs. So even though you're last in instruction, these other places, because of the way they play with the numbers, I said, okay, let's just look at salaries and benefits. And on this metric, you're not quite last, you're toward the bottom. <laughs> but think about this, think about this. The average is 30%. So let's just, can't we be average? Can't, you, can't Sonoma State be average? If Sonoma State was average, they'd have to spend $7 million more on instruction. And you guys could do the math on what that would be. Uh, we'll get to salary. So there's another peer group that I used. Uh, I got this from, you know, the Senate used this peer group for a purpose. It was last year, November 14. So I had a, I viewed this as a as a relevant peer group. I don't. You may not. You know, people on the Senate may not think this is a good peer group, or others may not think it's a good peer group. But it's certainly the one that you guys have up there. So I used it, and. So this is instructional salaries and benefits at a percent of total. So even on this peer group, not quite less. Westfield State, where my dear aunt used to teach, the reason I became an academic because of her and uh, in Massachusetts is below you. She was thrilled when I told her that. Uh, I don't know, again, I don't know what you think of these other peers, but that's who you guys are supposedly peers of. So you below this peer group as well. Okay, now I said, okay, 
benefits can be a weird thing, and let's just look sad. Okay, so let's just take all the set. Let's take everyone who works at Sonoma State. Look at their salaries, and look at the instruction salaries. What percent of salaries go to people who teach? And it's not even half. Not even half. That means the people who don't teach, the admins and everyone else, gets more than half. And you know what most people in the public think? Most people think this is 90%. Most people think that we get 90% of the whole thing. We don't even get half. So I did this for the whole CSU. Miraculously, you guys are towards the bottom. The CSU average is 52%. You're three million below average. That would mean eighty-four hundred dollars. Don't even get me started. They three million dollars. Remember, excess cash flow, seventeen million dollars a year. Just think of that. This is that other peer group. You're only two million behind them. It would mean fifty-three hundred dollars per FT faculty to get on a par with these peers. Two million per year. Yes, two million per year. They've got it. They clearly have the money to make you even with this peer group or your, S or your CSU peers. Every year they have the money to do it, and they choose not to. Upper level admin costs, I just, to be fair, you know, just here's, Sonoma is right middle of the pack. They're at 11.4, the average is 12.3, the median is 11.3. Maritime, which, I, which I've been with, that's, they're a little different kind of animal. Uh, those guys are on the boat for, they are, you guys know some of them, I'm sure. Uh, they're a different crowd. <laughs> they're definitely a different crowd. I certainly had my fun with them. Uh, so number of employees, now where's the money going? We'll get to the end, by the way, I promise. Uh, number of employees, non-instructional, instructional. Not good. Percent change over this period of time, non-instructional employees went up four, enrollment went up three, total employees went down two, full-time instruction went down 17%. This is a lot of numbers. This comes from iPads, they have new classification system. 15 new, just looking for the, from fall, this is, this is fall 12 to fall 14, okay, or fiscal 13, fiscal 15. 15 new managers, this is their own numbers. That's why, Elaine, that getting that data was really nice. Uh, thank you for the, thank somebody for that. Uh, 30, 15 new managers, 30, full-time instruction. So over this, just over these last couple of years, 15 new managers, 13 fewer faculty. Someone explain that to me? Uh, not good. Full-time, part-time, coming from something called the common data set, which again, Elaine, I thank you for getting that stuff for me. Uh, so your efforts were obviously worthwhile. Part from 12, you know, over time, they, there was a big decline in part-time hiring here, and now it's picked up. Full-time hiring just goes down all the time. If I just look from 12 to 15, yes, selective, but still pretty relevant. Over these last couple of years, big increase in, in part-time, big decrease in full-time hiring. A bunch of people got laid off in 2010. Yeah, and, and, that's, and so now they're back to the game of hiring more part-timers. Yes? When you say um, full-time, do you mean tenure time? I'm including, that's, that's a good, wait to get into that in a second, I'm including full-time non-tenure track and tenure track. Now we're gonna break that down the way what you're asked. So here we go. So here's tenure, tenure track, and here's non-tenure track. So to follow up on your question, non-tenure track, you saw a big, you see that big decline there. You, know, you said a lot of people were laid off then. I think you guys just, and you can, but now it's picked up. Look at the non-tenure hiring picking up. Tenure, tenure track. Look at tenure track. And we're gonna break that down further. Look at tenure track hiring. Enrollment at this time, you can't blame it on enrollment. <laughs> the reason this is going up is people are moving up through the system, but as I'm going to talk about in a second, these people are going to retire pretty, you know, eventually. So here's where we break down the tenure track. And here is the remarkable result. The big remarkable result to me is the incredible decline in assistant professors over this time period. Now, I understand right here. I, I wouldn't come here and just yell at you guys. I read everything. There were 20 new assistants hired according to your website. That's what I read. Now, for fall 15, they're not going to be in these numbers, obviously, because we don't have the iPads numbers. But, so, but even if that's the case, first of all, that doesn't mean this goes to 46, necessarily. F secondly, this total number may not. Some people leave. Now, I'm not saying 20 left. That, that's, there's no way 20 left. But there's no doubt that some of these people left. At the faculty here and everywhere is getting older. 
they're going to retire. These people can't work forever. At my place, we have the pine box strategy. They just die uh, <laughs> right on the job. You know, a couple of my department in recent years, they just die. I'm, I'm like, every day I wake up, I'm happy. I made it. Another day. <laughs> we have a defined contribution plan in my state. You guys still have a good old-fashioned pension here, don't you? Yeah. I don't care whatever you do. Keep it. Can I give you that advice? <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm not being flippant here. The reason... I'm, seriously, let me be serious. The reason why at my place and in my state people work are working so much longer is we're all on defined contribution plans. No one feels as if they can retire. The stock market is a very volatile thing. No matter how much, you, you know, you're still going to put your money in stock funds no matter what. Because if you put it all in bond funds, it's just not going to move very much. And so you're subject to the volatility of the stock market, which has done well, but certainly has ups and downs. And when you have a pension, you could plan better. You know what you're getting. It's reliable. Defined contribution plans are good for the employer. Defined benefit plans are good for the employee. Uh, you guys all get this? So hold on. Uh, we gave it up. We as a union and as, a, as faculty in a state gave it up in 1993. Ohio still has it, but it's going away. Ohio held on, but they're, about, they're, about, they're, they're, about, they're going away also. So Connecticut still has it. Connecticut still has a defined benefit plan for them, and they're not giving it up. There's no way the unions in, in Connecticut are giving that up either. So, but this is really alarming to me, really amazing. And they would have to hire 20 a year for about four years to, cut, to get to where they need to get. And is that going to happen? I, but this really shocked me. I couldn't believe it. You guys may know this, but it's not like they, they're not laying anyone off. Remember, let's, let's understand what's happening. No one's being laid off. They just not, when people retire, they just not, it's the easiest thing for them to do. Just don't replace them. So what happens? Either a, a full-time non-tenure track person, part-time people, or the classes don't get taught, or the same classes get taught. We just make, we increase class sizes we'll talk about. All those options are beneficial to those cash flows that keep going up. That's why those cash flows are going up. This is why these cash flows are going up. So this is it, this is it graphically. You can see there's where you said that people got laid off. Best. Some full-time people even got lectures, non-tenure track people got laid off. But that, that's hiring going up again. And it's not good. This comes from the CFA had, did a great report, Race to the Bottom. You guys have seen this, I hope. Uh, this comes right from their report. This, what this is showing is that tenure track hiring uh, throughout the system, pre-tenure, is going down and temporary faculty going up. It's, really, it's a great report. Uh, you, guys did a, you guys did a great job. And really shows it basically is this, but for every you know for everyone in the system, it's great stuff. So uh, I just pulled this from the website here, just as an aside on administration. This is the president's cabinet, for lack of a better term. And my question is: Is the core academic mission appropriately represented in this room? You guys decide. Enough academics in the room? I don't think so. Doesn't look that way. All right, good stuff, and then I'm really depressing stuff. This comes from the Sacramento Bee. This is basically, they get W-2 salaries is what they get. So I, this doesn't come from the university's records. Uh, these are, this is AUP stuff. So these are the top, I, I read all about this person at the top. I know the whole story. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I, it's as fishy to me as an outsider. Well, what the F are you guys doing here? Uh, Okay, I, I read the whole, I get it, I get it. I'm not saying this guy's here forever. I get that he's, yeah, I understand. But so we, we could eliminate, but he was in there. We could get rid of him if you like. I guess that's probably fair. And here are the others. I didn't put people's names here. My guess is you know them. <laughs> I don't know them. I'm sure they're all good people, but they're paid a lot compared to what you guys have paid. Average full professor. Average associate professor, average assistant professor. Is the average of the top 25, the median of the top 25? So this guy brings up the median. This guy brings up the mean a lot. See, that's why the median is probably more relevant. But the lectures aren't represented. Uh, the lectures, I, I, AEP salary survey data, I'll show you. It's not great with the lectures. It's, it's, we'll, we'll see in a second. So here's the lectures. And I'm, I'm not convinced of this. We don't collect this data the way you. I don't think we should. I don't think it's reported the way it should. But this is what they report for lecturers. I really am skeptical of this. No. I'm very skeptical. No. I don't think that you guys are like, no way. I, look, I agree with you 
I'm not sure. It just seems very high. Uh, but this is what the university reported to iPads, what they reported to the AUP. It's based on full time, but yeah. they don't give us. Is it FTEF or headcount? This is full time people only. Yeah, right. Full time people only. Anyone who's less than full time is not in here. Not in there. So, <laughs> you, the one thing you notice about these numbers, even this one here, though, you can see even even though it's I don't I, that's a hard time believing that happened. The assistant numbers went up a little because they get hired typically at market. Everything else, pretty 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 not not so good. So I put the lecturers in here. So here's the lecturers from looking from just the last two years, last three years that we have data for. So they're getting raises, dollar, a percentage raise for them is a big dollar, it's a big, a 1% raise for them is a lot bigger than a 1% raise for us. <laughs> you with me on that? Yeah. They got a bigger base, by like twice. Yes? So I don't know if you know this information, but with the average change, is that just basically percentages of increase in their salaries, or is that in personnel increases? Good question. This is looking at the average of all the changes. It's the average change. And these are the, the percent. This is, and this percentage change is not on the average percentage. To do it right, you've got to take the whole group. And I only took people who were the same human being was in the same job for three years. Same human being. And so I didn't have 25. I had like 20. Because I cut five out. They weren't the same person. You, you don't quite know what happened there. And so I had to cut five out. So the total of those 20, in total, they got this. Kind of, they got this kind of raise on average, which is not so compared to this, which is, and again, I don't know, you know, the lecture numbers, I think, are really, I don't, I don't think we do the greatest job, and it's unfortunate. Uh, and we did, for whatever it's worth, we spoke yesterday, we had a big conference call yesterday with the national office about, we really want to get a better handle. We, we're trying to do something now with the Chronicle and with Inside Higher Ed on a new database for part-time salaries and non tenure track. So it's, we're putting a lot of money into it. I don't think what we have now is good. I just don't. I think this data is not where it needs to be. And we do not report part-time salaries for faculty, for part -time for, uh, faculty, and we need to. Yes? Because the lecturer salaries depend highly upon the number of units they teach, which is very variable. Yeah. And I don't think that's in here. No. And we, we have to figure out a better way to do it. And so we talked about that a lot yesterday. And I'm not promising just because we talked about it means it gets solved. But I do, I will say this, we are putting money into it to try to get it right. Rudy and I realize we do this a lot and we're not happy. We represent, at my place, at his place, we represent everybody. And we just don't have the right data. And it's just not right. So. All right, so this is versus the other CSUs. I'm sorry, but uh, again, don't, I, look, you guys, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone. I'm just reporting what it is. So do not, I mean, this is, these are the numbers. You guys are, I mean, I have great respect for all of you, but the facts are uh, your salaries are significantly lower than the other CSUs on average. I don't, I don't know cost of living that well, but I can't imagine it's that cheap living up here. <laughs> I could be wrong about that, but it doesn't feel that cheap to me. I gotta believe a house costs a little more than it does where I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's just a wild guess on my part. So you guys are 22nd out of 23rd for Falls, 21st, 19th. This doesn't, again, I, I really, I reported here to, I, 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 you know, great respect for you guys. I just don't believe those numbers. I'm sorry, I just don't believe that that's the case. These are easier for people to report. Uh, now what I did was I looked at the change from here to here. So SSU lost ground at every level over the last three. This is just within the CSU. And the ranking, when I say down one, so you were 20th, now you're 21st. You were 18th, now you're 19th. You were 6th, now you're 5th. You were 22nd, you're still 22nd. But you lost 1% versus everybody else. And I understand you're on the same contract, but you guys probably have a larger, you have some of your more expensive, higher paid people who are uh, retiring. I'm sorry, that happens. Or some may, you know, the other word, uh, go away a different way. Uh, they don't make it, so uh, that's what drives would drive that result. And some leave for better paying jobs. And some leave. I think you see that. Yes, yeah, some leave because they can. Right. Right. Do you know which campus is last? I don't. I I, I certainly have it. Uh, 
I certainly have it. I just, I just thought it would be easier just to do it like this, but I certainly have. I can't remember who was left. Now, here I did it for the other peer groups. So, because I thought these were, these were, the reason I did this, and didn't, I, I'm sorry I didn't answer your question, I thought this was going to be the case that this peer group would have a wide variety of salaries. And you can see the CSU salaries aren't going to be this variant. You know, from top, even if I go from top to bottom, I'm not going to see this kind of range like I see here. And you can see you guys in this group, you're 8th out of 13 here, 6th out of 13 fourth. So it looks okay. This looks okay out of this group. However, this is what happened from 12 to 15. Now, bear with me here. So in 2012, you guys were 3,791 ahead of the average full at these places. Now you're 3,000 behind. So you've lost 6,803 versus these guys in three years. You lost, the, the associates lost that and the assistants. You, the ranking went from fifth, you were fifth, now you're eighth, fourth, now you're sixth, second, now you're fourth. So you've lost, if you believe in this peer group, you've done significantly worse versus them. You've done a little worse versus your CSU peers. So we always talk about two things, levels and changes. Your, your salary levels are low and the changes are getting worse. So it's low and getting worse. Yes, question? Oh, I was just noticing uh, for the other universities, it looked like the ones that are at the top of the salaries are all pretty much on the East Coast or Northeast. They probably have higher living. Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Florida, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York. Well, they're, they're a cracker state, but. Uh, yeah. I would guess it's cheaper. Often. Yeah. There's something to that. Absolutely. All right, last thing, good news, and presentation and good news. You're, you're, I don't know about this. This, this, this doesn't sit, when I, I, this comes in the common day. All of a sudden, you didn't, this didn't seem right to me, but uh, that's what's reported. Uh, but still more people graduating, which is good. Graduation rates, you know, you have this 2025 plan I read. Graduation rates are, through, are just really throughout this whole plan. You want to increase them, increase them, increase them. Well, you know, obviously, we want people to finish. Uh, you can see the four-year rate, the five-year rate, and the six-year rate. The six-year rate's the official rate. Uh, so these are the people started 407, finished by 13. We don't have the, even the most common, the most recent common data set didn't have the 408 numbers in it. It had places for them, but there were no numbers in there. Uh, and the retention rate, how many start, this is important that they come back. So you're losing close, you were losing 26% of the people didn't come back after one year, now you're losing 17%. That's really good to see that kind of improvement. I think it's really strong. And the last slide, or well, next to the last slide, is class size. Now class size is a funny thing, but this is the way they report it. How many students, how many sections have between two and nine students, between 10 and 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40, and more than 100? So what I, I kind of grouped them into three groups, two to 20. So I grouped these guys together, I grouped these three together, and these two together. You can see fewer smaller classes, more bigger classes. It's subtle, but it's there. There's, I don't know if you guys feel it, we've been here this whole time. There's definitely an increase in class size here. So students are getting more and paying less, and that's it. Thank you. Comments? Thoughts? Yes? Uh, you're probably aware of our president of 24 years. Yes, is, uh, you have a presidential search going on. So we're, we're really hoping we might see some changes next year. Well, presidential searches have taken front and center at the national level. You saw what happened at the University of Iowa. You guys see that? They had a search there. Uh, the search firm uh, brought four people to campus. They brought three academics and a business person. And they had forums, open forums, and they voted. You know, people gave their, their preferences, and all three academics got high grades from students, community, faculty, and the business guy got, no one wanted him, and they hired the business guy. Well, that's not going to happen here because they're not even going to tell us who the candidates are. Okay, so let me talk. That's what, that's what I was going to say. Is it going to be a club? So at my place, we just, I just spoke to our board on Tuesday. Uh, they decide to have a closed search, which means they don't bring the finalists to campus. Uh, that goes against our basic AUP principles. It goes against the principles of shared governance. We 
as an AUP, a union, we pulled, we had a rep on the search committee, we pulled that rep on Tuesday before we said we do not want to be part of the search process with the candidates and not for the finals of the conference. I'm not telling you guys to do it that way. That's what we both we decided that we announced it Tuesday. That's just the way it is. Yes. They don't tell our bargaining team that they don't have any money uh, because they could go to jail if they did. But um, they tell them they have competing priorities. What are their competing priorities? I mean, it's, it, it, to me here, it's buildings, dorms. Uh, that's where it, 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 it's, it's a beautiful place, but they put a lot of money into grounds. And it's, it's, it's student centers, rock climbing walls, and wave pools. And, and a lot of places other than here, it's athletic. You don't have athletics here. I mean, you have athletics. That's not where the point is going. And uh, reserves? The reserves are solid here as they are everywhere else. So, I mean, isn't that a competing priority? Yeah, it is. It, that's a good point. It is, it, it is because they want to keep that high bond rate. And I'm not saying they should just spend every dime they have. There's a level below which you don't want to go on reserves. But they're given, I mean, can we use metrics like can we get to the middle of our peer group in terms of spent on instruction? Those kind of, and they have the money to do that. So that's the kind of thing I think we could press. And it's true almost everywhere if you use outside peer groups outside of the CSU. I think here at Sonoma State, uh, it's definitely a different problem. Uh, because the salaries, and I know I, I knew this was going to happen. I, and I put it at the end of the presentation. I knew you guys would leave your own press. Uh, but I mean, I have to tell you the truth. I can't not report those numbers. Uh, they are what they are. And the salaries here are really low and compared to the other CSUs. And there's no end. Is it because the cost of living is lower? Is it because the classes you're teaching are different? I'm not so sure. I, I, can't, I don't see any difference in what you guys do here with the other places. I look at the programs, I look at the missions. And they seem not exactly the same, but I mean, there's still all that going on here. And, uh, it's puzzling why it's gone on for so long. Yes? You, you had a slide about class sizes, and I'm wondering if you've done comparisons with the other CSUs. Yeah, every place I go, I do the same thing with that class size thing. Every, it's, it's the, the entire CSU is increasing classes. Now, my guess is here, given the enrollment size, there's a limit as to how high they can go. This is not, I don't know this, but my guess is there's not that many rooms where they put a couple hundred students in a class. There's not how many, there must not be that many big rooms here where they can do it. In San Jose, I saw a much more direct shift towards those very large classes. A much, the student body is much larger there. They have an older uh, infrastructure with a lot of big, older lecture halls. And I think, I'm, I don't know about the new classrooms that have been built here. They tend to build new dorms. Uh, but hopefully, if they build new classrooms, they don't build them with 300 seats in them. They build them with 30 seats. We've kind of insisted on that. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that's really important, not just for here, not just for now, but going, going forward. Because if they have classrooms that are big, they can put them in there. put the students in there. So I, I don't think the class size situation here is as bad as it was, for example, in San Jose. Or San Marcos, by the way. They also did the same thing in San Marcos, surprisingly. They also, I, I, by the way, I went there last fall, last spring. I'm still tired from walking up those damn stairs. Uh, have you ever been to San Marcos? Any of you guys ever been there? To walk from this, when you get to campus to where you're going, it's like three and a half weeks. I mean, I'm all on it. <laughs> my, my, is that true? <laughs> At least you guys all fly. <laughs> yes? How do you factor in uh, teaching online? Well, my view on online, I think they, uh, they certainly count as enrollment like anything else. But my view on online is that it's mostly good for them. Uh, they, they charge an extra fee here. I saw that. They charge, there's a little bit of an extra fee that they charge the students for, you know, for taking an online class. But you know what? I, well, I saw the fees here. They have fees in almost every class you guys got. They seem to have an extra fee. You know what I'm saying? Like, all the upper level classes seem to have, you guys, know, you guys know what I'm saying? They all seem to have these extra fees, uh, which go to the departments mostly, I think, which is good. But online, I really think that's, and I think you guys led the charge. I think we've, I'm not against online per se, and I don't teach online, but I'm not against it. And I think it can be a useful strategy for certain groups of uh, students in certain programs. But I think the CFA and the CSU faculty, when you guys kind of took that, ex that MOOC experiment and you guys and kind of showed that that's not the path forward, uh, I do see around the country 
a much less emphasis on online. The woman at the University of Virginia who got fired because she didn't have enough online, I do not see administrators seeing and boards seeing online as the answer to everyone's prayers. Uh, though, at a place like this, it has to work some, but you know, at, at, you know with 8,000 students here, I can't imagine you want a majority of your classes taught online. I can't imagine that's what you guys would want or what the students and their families would want. They're living here. You, I mean, you, there's been a big push to get the kids to live here, from what I can tell. Well, if they're living here, they might as well actually get up out of the dorm and go to class. The majority of my students live three to five hours away, and that's why I teach them totally online. Yeah, I mean, I think for some, I think for some majors, we have, you know, there's some majors we have found master entire programs go online, and I think for some it really works. Yeah. And because otherwise it wouldn't happen. But for the ones where the kids live here and they're just not getting out of their dorm rooms, and they just, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. That I don't buy. Yes? Um, I was wondering back on the graphs that you had when you were talking about admin and academic support and everything, um, where the, the unit four staff kind of fall into that, or were they more on the admin side, or this, and I saw services. Yeah, let me see if I had, let me see if I had that graph. Let me see if I, let me see if I can find that. I don't know if I put it in or not. I certainly have a slide that has what you're describing. Let me see if I have that right here, okay? This graph here has all the different categories of worker by iPads. Now, it's hard for me to know what's union and what's not from this group. I believe management occupation is obviously not. Uh, I don't know how many unions are on this campus besides uh, CFA. How many? This, and so a lot of these other workers are represented by different unions. I can tell you in my campus exactly where, where, where these boxes go to which union. And, but that's, this is where it would be. This is where I broke it down by. And I actually have this, I didn't report the salaries, but I actually had the salaries also. Of, of all those different groups. Obviously, the management ones are higher. Uh, and the librarians are, uh, they're in your unit, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So they're, but they're, they're you know, they're, they're definitely in the unit, uh, for sure. And a lot of, there are some other, there are some other workers here who are in your bargaining unit who are in some of those other categories. Librarians, for sure. But I think a lot of the, like this is going to be a separate union. That could be a separate union. Yeah, right, right. Those are not going to be part of your union right there. That's right. right. Those are going to be in, in the other unions. But I think some in here, and maybe even some in those two, are going to be in your bargaining unit. They could be act what we would call, we sometimes call academic professionals. I think some of those in those two categories, business and finance and computer engineering and science, uh, I think there could be some people that are in your bargaining unit that are in those categories. But I don't know the degree to how much. So this is, this is the way, the, the university itself, this comes from iPads, the university itself does not provide such a breakdown. Uh -huh. They should, but they don't. Yes? Uh, Follow-up question to that. So which of your data sets were sort of publicly available sources and which of your data sets required permission? Uh, Nothing required permission, everything's public. Okay. Uh, what took time, the iPads data was not, well, that's, that's too, too short an answer, let me give you a full answer. The iPads data, when I go on iPads, which is a site that anyone, anyone can go on, it only has data for certain areas through 2013, not through th 2014. So Elaine was able to get from me. They submitted it to iPads in April of 15. But iPads is not gonna let us see, because it takes them time to do it. I'm not gonna see it until about Christmas. So, but I'm here in October, and I know they submitted it, and I know it exists, so, why not get it? So it's not quote unquote publicly available to everyone, though it is a public, it is a document that everyone can see. The big one though, is the audited financial statements. Uh, that's the goal, that's the one. That's the one I want. Uh, last year's came out in, I think, November. I can't remember the exact date. And that's the one, because that, what that does is it has the financial statements of the CSU as a whole, then it has all, the financial statements of all the 23 campuses separately. It's a hundred, almost a 200 page document. And that's the one, that will tell us what happened in 15. That would really enhance, and that's why, you know, 
that's why we spoke with the CFA leadership. I thought it would be really important in terms of bargaining, if I could. I, I know it's important, I think, in terms of bargaining to get that. Because if we're bargaining at the table, if they, if they know something that we don't, that's not great. And so I, I, I can't, I, my, my view is how could you settle a contract without knowing what happened in 15 when you know and we don't. So I think they, they're going to give that data up uh, one way or another before this thing gets settled. That, that's going to happen. Uh, I wish it would have happened already. Uh, you know, bar people posture. They do what they do. And they'll come around. Yes? I was wondering after your look at uh, our situation, what would be your top suggestions for a couple strategies to change? That's a good question. I, m my view is the metrics of percent cent spent on instruction, percent of salaries versus total salaries. Can't we be to the middle of the CSU? Can we? If you're asking for me at Sonoma State, for the people who work here, can't we at least be in the middle? Can't we get towards the middle, towards, the, towards our peers? And that would mean two things, hiring and salary increases. Now, I know salary increases, you guys have bargained for stuff, but there are other ways they could get you guys money if they wanted to here. There is still a provision for an equity. Yeah, and so, I mean, they, if they want it, but, you know, Elaine, they have to want it. They have to, <laughs> you can't just, you have to actually, get them to do that. Yeah, they, they can, whether they will. So, but I, to answer your question, I mean, come on, we have the percentage spent on instruction here versus the other CSUs. Can't we get to the middle? Can we get to the middle on the percent spent on salaries to the middle versus the other CSUs and versus the other peers? Those are the things I would point to. Uh, and, the num and the last thing is the hiring. Okay, I think it's great that there was 20 new hired. I think that's wonderful. Obviously, someone here looked at those numbers. I mean, I'm not the only one who knows how to look at these numbers. And they realize, we got to do something here. Now, can there be a definitive hiring plan for the next five years? Can we come up with a definitive hiring plan of new, because new assistant professors, not, it's not just to put more money in. They bring new blood. That's what the, that's what the university needs. You need new voices, new blood, new ideas, new, new ways of looking at things. You need new assistant professors. That's what makes a university go. That's the, the lifeblood of the university. So can we come up with a plan, administration? And that's outside, I think that's outside of bargaining. Can we come up with a plan together to increase hiring? I don't know how the 20 happened here. I don't know if the Senate or the CFA or jointly put some pressure on them uh, to do that. Uh, my guess is yes. Administrators don't do that on their own. Uh, but let's, that's, that, this, if that's just one time, that's not good enough. It's not good enough for the students and their families. And the other thing is, I think from a student perspective, students don't like law and their families don't like larger classes. And I think we could, again, sit down with the administration here and figure out a way to make sure that we keep our commitment to small classes, which I'm sure is a commitment you make to these students and their families when you bring them in here. So let's make sure we keep to it. Yes? I have one more follow up. I've been here a long time and I watched the, uh, what they call debt service climb at an astronomical rate. Yeah. And you were saying that it appears that they have enough resources to take care of this. It's just not a big deal. So, so you don't see that as... No, I don't. Because see, it, it's a good question. But when I did the excess cash flows, I took out the interest payments. So they have enough money to take care of Easily. That. Easily. It's not a problem. They've got the money. They don't have the will. And so let's convince them that it's in everyone's best interest, the students, their families, your interests, our interests. It's a win-win across the board to put more resources and have more full-time faculty, have small classes, and pay people an appropriate wage from part-time up to full-time. Everybody. Yes? Did, did you see that article in our paper, local paper today, about the strike possibilities? The, figure, I the figures that they quoted in there for average, wasn't just the whole state, average for the system was like close to 100,000. For salary? Yeah, they're yeah. much higher than the figures you had here. They're much higher than I know anybody, or most people get here. How can that be corrected? That's like, that was an associate press article. I'll make sure, I'll, I'll look at it, and I'll try to, I mean, I'm going to talk to Jen Egan when I'm done here, send her this stuff, and 
talk about ways that we can uh, use that. What they often do, with, when you analyze faculty salaries, you should never take an average of everybody, because the, 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 it's always got to be by rank, which is why it's so upsetting we don't have a better handle on non-tenure track and part-time. But so they average, they may, they may be adding, they may also be adding uh, benefits. They could also, they, they likely are doing that. And when you add benefits, it gets a little, obviously those numbers get higher. Uh, but they're probably adding benefits, is my guess. You know, look, see if they use the word compensation or salary. Uh, it's just a, but, you know, you guys know Alice Sunshine who works for, you know, as a press person for the CFA. She's pretty damn good. Alice knows, uh, Alice knows how to respond to that kind of stuff. Yes? Do you think there's significant pressure to keep these high margins in order to keep the bond rating up, to keep the cost of capital low for the CSU? Yeah, that's absolutely the truth. Okay. Absolutely. They wear that thing. They think that is the most important thing. They really believe that. I don't think they're bad people, the people in the CSU chances. I don't think they're trying to not spend. But they, they really believe that this is what you, the train that you just articulated, that's exactly the way they look at the world. And they view that as a higher priority than the things that we're talking about. And we have to tell them that it's not. And we're not telling you to spend everything into the ground. We're saying, given where you are, you have the resources to change the way uh, we do business here to make it better for the students and their families. Yeah. Has anyone done like a sensitivity analysis where you said, if you had this ratio, that's, you yeah. would have this cost of capital? Yeah. That, 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 yeah that's, that's a good point. Let's say your interest rate, let's say your rating went from AA2 to AA3 or to, a, you know, or, or to A1. What would it do to you? It would, it would be so minimal. But they really like an AA2. Mm -hmm. They really like it. Because uh, of the reasons you just said. And it, it gives them, and they also say the reason it is so high is because we keep costs under control, which is a fancy word for saying all the things they've been doing that we showed you they do. Yes? Uh, I noticed that for the expenses on research, it was zero, 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 one percent. Yeah, and then it went up. There was nothing. In, I, I think the reason is, I think in the past, they just didn't put anything in that category. Who knows where they put it in. Uh, you have a research administrator here. I think there is someone with that high title here. Uh, so I don't know if there was nothing in there, if that person didn't have a job before. That job didn't exist in the past or not. But it's still very small. The amount of money in research That's is still very But there was nothing for a while in the audited statements. Yeah. And in iPads, there was nothing either. And there was no salaries in iPads either. So they, they, would, they report not just research. Most of that research is salaries of people who work in the research office. It's not so much spending on, it's not like doing research or stuff like that. But there's a couple of people that work. I think I did see someone, one of the top administrators works in that research, has a title associated with some sort of research. Is there any comparison with other? Yeah, I, I think if you look at the other CSUs, they, they have much more re research dollars in here. But some of that could be categorization. Maybe they just put it somewhere different. And what I would, to, to follow up, what I would do for that is you could add instruction plus research and compare them. But a lot of the CSUs are not putting significant dollars into research. Yes, in the back? Yeah, did you just say that somebody, one of the top 25, has the word research in their title? I thought so. Can you put it back up? Yeah, I, I, maybe. <laughs> no, let me see if I, let me see if that's the case. Uh, the memory serves me. Uh, let's see. Right here, AVP for Faculty Affairs Chief Research Officer, $142,000. Okay. So that's, 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 that's the one that I remember. I don't, okay, I don't know, and I don't, as I looked at the, pa when you look at the past salaries, I don't think that person either was here a couple years ago or didn't have that kind of salary a couple years ago. So. I think that refers to somebody who does numbers about the university, not Okay, I'm not. Okay, I'm not, I'm not. Research. Yeah, I, that's, that's the title. Yeah. That name could be assistant or associate, I'm not sure. That's VP, Vice President for Faculty Affairs, Chief Research Office. What role is he? All right. Anything else, you guys? All right. Let's go, Max. Thank you.